So thank you all for coming out in uh, not great weather to hear uh, discussion of these two books. And uh, we're, we're, the format will be that I will interview Steve for about 30 minutes, and then he will interview me for about 30 minutes. And so you better be nice to me on the first 30 right. minutes. I got the last shot, Mr. Rubin. So for anybody who's been under a rock for the last 30 years, Steve is the person who built AOL. And uh, then uh, after... Thank That's before... How many people here were customers of AOL? Anybody? Okay. All right. Wow, okay. I was in Detroit this morning at the Forbes Under 30 conference. This is more of my constituency. <laughs> They okay. kind of vaguely know AIM, but... How many people are still using AOL? <laughs> wow, okay, a couple of people there. Okay, so, um, and then Steve, uh, after um, he left uh, AOL time, Warner AOL, he um, started Revolution, which is a venture capital firm in Washington, D.C., and uh, as part of that, he started something called Rise of the Rest, and uh, this book is about that. And I should disclose that I am an investor in Rise of the Rest. Thank you, David. So, um, okay, and I, let's, let's talk about the, the, this way first. Um, Steve, can you explain the concept behind Rise of the Rest? What is the theory behind what, was, what you were trying to do with it? Well, first of all, it's great to be here, and uh, particularly, you know, it'll be fun to do this with David. We've worked together on a variety of different, different things over the years. And the fact that we both had books coming out within you know, a couple of weeks, uh, having, you know, I, you know, he's done a lot of interviews, I've done a lot of interviews, but this is going to be more interesting, I think, than some of the other ones. Uh, so the backstory on Rise of the Rest is I was asked about a decade ago uh, to co chair something here in Washington called the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, and that led to a number of things, including recommending to the White House and President Obama more focused on startups, and they decided to launch something called Startup America Partnership, and I was asked to chair that, uh, and then worked on this Jobs and Competitiveness Council uh, focused on, on some legislation, including the Jobs Act. And for me, this was a wake-up call, because I did not, I guess I was minding my own business, I did not fully understand the role new companies, startups, played in job creation. And the data was pretty, uh, pretty clear that small business is super important. And we learned that even during the pandemic, which is why we worked hard to protect small business. Accounts for a lot of jobs. But actually, as a sector, it doesn't account for a lot of net job growth. One restaurant goes out of business, somebody else takes it over. It's about the same number of jobs. So super important, but not a big job growth engine. And big business, surprisingly, the Fortune 500 companies also are not big job creators. Some are rising, some are falling. As a sector, it's not a big job creator. It's new businesses under five years that are the major job creators. I didn't know that. Um, so that was the first data point. The second data point was, while not every new business wants or even needs venture capital, the ones that are most successful, that create the most jobs, that drive the most economic growth, do raise venture capital. And then it got interesting because 75% of venture capital in this country over the last decade has gone to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts, 75%. So if the big job creators are new companies and the biggest job creators are venture-backed companies, and we're primarily backing venture, these, backing these companies in a few places like Silicon Valley, New York City, Boston, and so forth, but not in the rest of the country, what that probably will lead to is some people in some places doing really well and other people in other places feeling left out, left behind. Uh, so that got me on this, okay, what do we do about it? And we started these bus tours, or Rise of the Rest bus. Actually, the first one, interestingly, was eight years ago in Detroit. So it was you know, fun to be back in Detroit this morning. Uh, and now we've done dozens of, of, of cities all around the country. And then four or five years ago, as you know, because you were, you know, I'm grateful that you were one of the first people to commit to it, we decided to actually launch a Rise of the Rest investment fund, almost put our you know, money where our mouth was. And so far we've backed 200 companies in 100 cities. So it went from initially focused on policy and you know, how do we create jobs. At the time this, you know, this was done a decade ago, unemployment was nearing 10%, so job creation was a you know, big priority for everybody. 
then led into kind of some efforts that were philanthropic, which then led to some efforts that were more trying to mobilize more things in more communities, which then led to the, the investment fund, and finally that led to the book. Okay, so who came up with the, the phrase, rise of the rest? That seems like a nice... Well, actually, uh, we stole that. What? <laughs> we did. Okay. Okay. I, I got to admit, so this is a, kind of a hometown crowd. This is the second book I've written. The first book came out six years ago called The Third Wave. I stole that name, too. Oh. So here's the story. And I'll get it off my chest. I'll sleep better tonight. So I re read a book 40 years ago uh, when I was in college called uh, uh, The Third Wave by Alvin Toffler, the futurist. And he talked about the sort of agriculture revolution, industrial revolution, he was predicting essentially the digital revolution right. and the internet. And so I was all struck by that. And my book was the third wave focused on the internet, the first wave, second wave, third wave. So I, I stolen is so probably where, where strong. Did, I'm, I'm saying where, borrowed. Where did you get the name AOL? Did you steal that? Or? Well, can I? <laughs> David, I do get the second half hour. Just, again, I want to remind you here that I have uh, two sets of questions, the okay. nice ones and the less nice ones. All right, sorry, let, me finish, so you, let, me, sorry. Whoa, whoa, let me finish your question. I'm, I'm still getting this off my chest. Right, okay. Let me, let, I want to sleep better tonight. So Rise the Rest, actually, I first heard it from Fareed Zakaria when he wrote a book over probably 15 years ago that talked about what was happening globally and was predicting that some nations, China in particular, China, India, others, would rise, and that didn't mean the United States would fall, but on a relative basis, it would change the game. I thought, well, that was sort of interesting. And so when we launched this effort, we said, let's use that as a concept, because we're not saying Silicon Valley is going to fall. We're going to say other cities around the country are going to, are going to rise. So that is why we called it Rise of the Rest. And I then learned that Fareed actually got it from somebody else. So we're all... <laughs> Okay, so Passing to go it back on. to the, the venture capital world more or less started after World War II in the United right. States. Veterans came back from World War II, they had technology skills, and some of them started companies in Silicon Valley, and people didn't know what venture capital was, they called it adventure capital and right. things like that. But for a while, when maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Boston, Route 128, was considered a leading company, and there was Wang, there was DEC, and so right. forth. How did Silicon Valley supplant Route 128 as the place for the biggest venture capital firms to thrive up until we talk about rise of the rest? What was it about Silicon Valley that made so many people go there? Mark Zuckerberg left the East Coast, he went right. there, other people go there. Why, what is it about Silicon Valley that made it so great? Well, first of all, if, if you look back 40 or 50 years ago, look some of the, the history and even some of the early decade, first decade or two of the internet, it actually was not just about Silicon Valley. Some of the most important companies were spread all over the country. We were in, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Hayes, the modem company, was in Atlanta. Sprint, the communications company, was in Kansas City. IBM's PC operations were in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, Dell was in Austin. Microsoft actually stat started in Albuquerque before moving to, to Seattle. So that first generation of companies, it was, it was much more regionally distributed. It was the second wave of the internet where when it became, instead of building the on-ramps to the internet, building software and apps on top of the internet, that's when Silicon Valley really became dominant. And to your question, it, venture capital actually started a little bit in New York and then kind of moved a little bit to Boston and then moved a little bit to San Francisco. And in the last 20 years, because it has been around software, coding as the core thing, with a lot of founders being engineers, uh, that created this ecosystem and these massive successes. That then led people to say, if I'm you know, at different universities in the country or growing up in different parts of the country, if I want to participate in the innovation economy, I need to go there. That's where the action is, that's where the people are, that's where the money is, which led to a massive brain drain from many, right. many, many communities, further feeding that. And I think we hit peak Silicon Valley two or three years ago. It will still be the leader of the pack, but it will be much less dominant in the right. next 10 or 20 years. All right. The premise of Rise of the Rest is that there are smart people starting nice companies in other cities in the United States, and it doesn't have to be in Silicon Valley. They just need either more money or more attention or, or something, and that was what's behind your idea. Yeah, uh, I would even go beyond nice companies. I'd say some kick-ass, change the world, you know, gigantic companies are birth, being birthed in different parts of, of, of the country. And the perception has always been that, okay, because historically, again, 
relatively recent history, a couple decades, you know, the action in Silicon Valley, that if a company in, was in Madison, Wisconsin, or Atlanta, Georgia, or Columbus, Ohio, or you name it, that was kind of like the junior varsity. The real companies were, were on the coast, okay. particularly in, in Silicon Valley. And that started to change over the last decade. The most important healthcare, health tech company in the country is a company called Epic basically controls most of the electronic medical records. They're in Madison, Wisconsin. They're not in Silicon Valley. They're not in Boston. Uh, you're seeing more and more of these examples that are, that are percolating around the country, but the story still has been overwhelmingly focused on a few places, predominantly Silicon Valley. Most of the money's been invested there, uh, and, and so that led to this you know, dynamic, which, as I said before, is, is, is you're missing out a lot of great entrepreneurs, building a lot of great companies in other places, and you're also missing out as a country uh, in, to have a more kind of inclusive innovation economy. One last point, and I'll let you ask another question. It's not just about place, this 75% going to three states. Two other little data points just to put in your head, and hopefully it will bother you as well, uh, that if you look at not just place, but people, that right now, even though women are 50% of the population, female founders get less than 10% of venture capital. Even though black Americans are 13% of the population, black founders get less than 1% of venture capital. So this is a broader issue. The, you know, the, the data is pretty compelling that even though this is the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world, I'm super proud of it, you know, and, and hopefully we'll continue to lead the, lead the way, it does matter where you live, and it does matter what you look like if you have an idea whether you really have a fair shot at building a company, a fair shot at kind of pursuing the American dream. So this is about leveling the playing field more, more broadly. Okay, so I was gonna ask you about that because Silicon Valley is famously male-dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be an engineer from Stanford and a male, typically, to get funding. But what your premise was is that you could find cities where there were good entrepreneurs, and they might be women, they might be minorities, and so forth. So to go back to it, were you out um, on your bus tours in these cities before you raised your fund, yeah. or you, are you there? So you went out. Uh, initially, initially it was this policy focus and some, you know, working on some legislation, and then we said let's let's take the next step, let's hit the road. So we started going to Detroit, Pittsburgh, all these different cities, and spent a lot of time in advance, like six months in advance, to understand what's going on, and then a lot of time when we were there. Part of the reason we have a bus, it's a little bit of an Americana road trip, you know, kind of uh, media friendly uh, thing. But it's also for us kind of a convening platform. When we're in a city, we bring people together in different parts of the community. Many times they don't know each other, but should know each other. So that, and then e every day at the end, we had a pitch competition and we'd invest in, in the company that, that won it. Uh, then we decided about five years ago, rather than just doing that in terms of some cities and some. You know, pitch competitions, we'd broaden it to more cities and, and partner with regional venture firms. And this is a very uh, uh, positive statistic that we just learned late last year when we did some uh, research with PitchBook. That in the last decade, 1,400 new venture firms have started in Rise of the Rest cities, meaning outside of San Francisco, New York, and Boston. 1,400. And so there's now more capital in these cities than existed you know, 10 years ago. So we partner with them. We've co-invested now with over 300 of them. And they you know, provide op, you know, sort of sourcing opportunities for us. And then we ne network them together into this broader Rise of the Rest network. Before you raised the fund, you were going out on a bus tour. Who would, who would go on the bus tour with you? Entrepreneurs or? Uh, we'd, entrepreneurs, investors, okay. you know, politicians. Right. We, we'd, you know, we'd try to you know, fill the bus with all kinds of folks. Okay, so you get there and then you have a contest with people, local entrepreneurs, they can compete for it was a hundred thousand dollar right. investment. Okay, did any of those that got the hundred thousand turn out to produce really good companies? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, I'll give you a few examples in uh, Chattanooga. Uh, when we were there, the winner of the pitch competition was a company called Freight Waves, uh, and basically what Freight Waves is is a think of it like a Bloomberg data platform for the trucking and logistics industry. Huh. I didn't know this till we were in Chattanooga, but the biggest trucking companies in the country are headquartered in Chattanooga. So if you're trying to do Bloomberg for trucking, Chattanooga is the best city. They've gone on to scale. The company that won in Indianapolis, started by uh, 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 Megan Glover, who was, uh, had been in the tech world, a company called Exact Target that Salesforce acquired there, but also as a mom. And about five years ago, uh, was quite concerned about the Flint water crisis that was not that far away from where she was, and said, I wonder if, if, uh, 
if, I wonder if the water my kids are drinking is safe. So she called the water utility and said, I'd like to get my water tested. They said, well, we don't do that for people. Like, <laughs> okay. So she said, she said, but you can call this, this is the company that does it. You call that company and said, well, we do it, but we do it more for like businesses and it'll cost you like $3,000. Okay. So rather than just say, okay, she actually did something about it. And she started this company called 120 Water, uh, initially focused on consumers. Now they actually have deals where they provide this, this system for cities, including like San Francisco. And that company also has, has, uh, has scaled up. So there are dozens of these companies. And the, and the reason I decided to write the book is I've had the opportunity to hit the road, see this firsthand, see what's happening with these companies, see what's happening with these cities. Go back to Detroit. I remember visiting there about 10 years ago. There's a hotel, Weston, in the downtown area. I, you know, I got out in the morning and I was going to go for a jog. And the person in front said, don't go that way. Don't go that way. It's not safe. So I went the other way. Uh, and I've been back almost every year since. And now you can go anyway. The city has been revitalized, building 100 buildings that were empty, pretty much empty, are now filled. They're now building new buildings. Uh, it's, it still has challenges. It, 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 I'm not trying to diminish some of the challenges, particularly in the greater Detroit area. But a, a city that just 10 years ago was really struggling. In fact, the year before we arrived, the city went bankrupt. The city of Detroit went bankrupt. Uh, and now it's showing real momentum because of this focus on startups, because of this focus on on, on new companies. And so that, we're seeing these examples in more and more cities around the country. And it, frankly, it's, it, you can't read this book and not be more optimistic about this next chapter for America, as long as we are in, continue to be intentional about leveling the playing field. Okay, so after doing this for a year or two, you, or you decided to raise a fund. Mm -hmm. And how hard was it to convince your- You are difficult. You're difficult. I was the hardest one. It's my do it was actually my daughter. Well, the, 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 interesting, the interesting thing, and David was not alone on this. It, 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 it sort of tells you something about it. it when when I, I talked to you about this, you said, okay, seems interesting. Should I think of this as investment? Where I'm gonna generate a return? Or should this be in like my philanthropy bucket? Um, it sort of seemed like a good thing, but I'm not gonna really generate a return. I said, we will only be successful if we generate top tier returns. Because if we generate top tier returns backing you know, all these different people in all these different places, that will surprise the big coastal money. And over time, they'll, you'll, you'll see a ship. And you, you said, okay, well, hey. I, I did, I, for full disclosure, we were having breakfast at with another uh, one of our investors, uh, Mike Milken, at his conference in LA three or four months ago, and uh, I asked how it's doing. I gave him the numbers in terms of the, the IRR and so forth, and both of them looked shocked. It's like, we really didn't think this was going to work. <laughs> <laughs> but they believed anyway, or at least backed us anyway, and, and right. so forth. So, it's so your well. first fund you raised, I can't remember, it was 100 or 100? $150 million. Yeah. $150 million. And then you raised a second fund. Yeah. And, um, and maybe you'll raise a third fund. But um, all right, so today you've got investments in these two funds in how many companies now? 200 companies. 200 companies. And in the end, uh, for those who aren't investment professionals, the net- Well, we'll get to that soon when we talk about okay. how to invest. Okay. <laughs> the net internal rate of return you would expect people to get would be 5%, 10%, 15%, higher. 20% net, 25%. Wow. We'll see. I'm not, we're not. I know. This isn't yeah, the SEC. You can't. This is like probably SEC, SEC people SEC here. here. I'm not, <laughs> but no, we said we're going to generate you know, top-tier returns, and okay. we're on track to do that. Okay. So now the point has been largely proven, and um, are you going to um, uh, go to more cities? How many bus tours can you do? Or you don't need to do bus tours anymore? We, the bus tours, we have not done, obviously, because of the pandemic. We haven't done one in And in what did you do three. during the pandemic? I mean, how did you go see? You didn't do any bus tours. You did it by We did not do bus virtual. tours. We did, we did it because we've now built this, this network in different cities with these, these venture firms we're co-investing in. And the way we've done it, it's a little bit different. We have other parts of Revolution Ventures and growth and so forth. But for the rise of the rest, it's a little bit different. We, we're trying to not just have a successful fund, but the process helps support many entrepreneurs, many investors in many places. So we work with the local 
on the venture firms. They lead the rounds. They take the board seats. So we then connect them together in this in this okay. in this in this broader network. So that it's to us, it's sort of how do you catalyze a broader systems level you know, change? And it's but it's not again. It's not just of course we're investors and we're investing, but the broader idea is that if we're going to have a more inclusive innovation economy, we have to be backing more entrepreneurs in more places, creating more jobs in more places. And I think the, you know, the momentum we're seeing on that front is, is, is encouraging. Where does the Washington DC area stand in kind of uh, this uh, firmament? Are we a good place to start businesses? Did you have a bus tour here? Have you invested in this area? We have, we have invested in this area. We, I've not done a bus tour here, although some people in Washington think we should, uh, but I was at the, uh, you know, the uh, startup week in DC just uh, two weeks ago. Um, and I would say the momentum is strong. And part of this is based on, as we talked about at the beginning, my own experience co-founding AOL in Tyson's Corner in 1985. And for those who don't know this, back then, only 3% of people were online. 3%, one, two, three. And those 3% were online an average of one, one hour a week. So we said we wanted to get America online. We weren't kidding. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting, uh, particularly some on, maybe on the, on the government side, when we started in 1985, it was illegal against the law for consumers or businesses to be on the internet. It had been funded by DARPA and it was limited at the time to government agencies and educational institutions. So if you work for the government, you can be on. If you work, you were a student at a university or, or work in a university, you could be on, but consumers or businesses couldn't be. So it took us a while to kind of commercialize that. The other piece about starting here is there was no venture capital in the area. All the money we raised which was a whopping one million dollars in the you know for the first you know, to launch the company, was from other places: Boston, Toronto, New York, Chicago, San Francisco. None of it from from this area. As you know, the, the, what's happened in the last few decades has been quite positive. There's some sectors like cyber and others that are showing a lot of momentum, and it's striking that Amazon, after doing this national search for their second headquarters site, picked Northern Virginia, which was inconceivable you know, 30 years ago when it was really a government town and, you know, government contractors and so forth, that was not really a very strong startup, which I think actually helped inform my passion about supporting these entrepreneurs in these places, but also my belief that it could happen, that these other cities could rise. I saw, you know, the early days we thought in the struggle, I've seen it in other cities, so that just kind of led so, me to say, okay, we, this is doable. Are we getting to the point where I get to start oh, interrogating you? So let oh, me you ask five you, Steve, minutes, a couple more questions. So yeah. when you are looking to give somebody, I think you're trying to run out the clock. I think that's what the plan is. <laughs> you're looking to give some people some money. What are you looking for in the entrepreneur? What is it that, what are the, the things you say, this person has it, this person doesn't have it? Well, first of all, we're not looking to give people money. We're looking to back entrepreneurs and invest with the idea of generating a significant return on that because they are going to be successful entrepreneurs. We look, idea is really important. Is it an idea that's important, a, kind of a battle worth fighting? And so sectors where like healthcare or food and, and, and financial services, a lot of areas that like, matter in terms of people's lives is, is, is important. Do they have a theory of the case why they can do something that has the potential to be you know, kind of a, a significant. Do they have the team and the diversity you need on a team in terms of different you know, perspectives uh, to really be able to, to build that? Because we've learned entrepreneurship is a, is a, is a team sport. Do they have uh, some early partners? Because we've learned that partners can be really accelerants uh, in, in, in terms of this. So there's a number of different you know, factors that we- But if somebody is great, you meet somebody and you say, you're really great, this idea is not so good, but you're good, I'd like to back you on some good idea. Or do you ever see people that have a great idea, but they're not so great. <laughs> that never have we ever happens. seen somebody who has a great idea that they're not, they're not so great? Yes, we've seen, we've seen people who have so ideas, but we don't believe they can they execute can do it, so against those ideas. And we have definitely seen people that we were impressed by the entrepreneur, but less impressed by that particular business. So, so is it too complicated to say, get a better entrepreneur CEO, we like the idea, or 
or proceed? Do you have an idea you want to pitch to me here? I think we're, <laughs> is that where we're going? I know you want to be another, after Carlisle was, was pretty. Okay. Uh, so what about the fourth wave? In this book, you talk about the fourth wave. What is the fourth wave? Well, it's really the convergence of a lot of factors that I think are kind of been quietly bubbling on the, on, over the last you know, decade, I think are really, each of them accelerating, and as they converge, it has the opportunity to really help accelerate the, this rise. Some of it we, we talked about in terms of more venture firms and more parts of the country, which is super helpful to the entrepreneurs to get that initial capital to, to, to get started. Some of it is actually government focus on policy, both at a state and local level. A lot more governors, a lot more mayors now are focused on, on, on startups, and at a federal level, including some of the legislation that passed this, this summer both the Chips and Science Act, which uh, kind of uh, authorized uh, $10 billion for, for, for regional hubs. We still have to appropriate that, but we have Doris Matsui here, so I think that will be done shortly. Uh, and also, more recently, the Inflation Reduction Act, which also had some, some funding of, of some key industries of the future, including some things in the sustainability sector. So the government piece of it, is they're leaning in, and, with, and even Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, two weeks ago, talked you know, about the need for more of a place-based policy to, to partly to level the playing field, give more people more opportunity. And the other one that's probably the biggest tipping point of this is the pandemic. And, you know, the pandemic has been terrible and, and obviously you know, tragic in so many different ways. But if you're looking for kind of a silver lining, uh, I think it will end up being that catalytic, accelerating, tipping point moment for the rise of the rest. And the reason for that is a good number of people uh, used it as an opportunity to take a step back and where do I want to live and how do I want to live and where do I want to work and how do I want to work and remote work and hybrid work and so forth, which has led after this brain drain of people leaving to a boomerang of people returning. So there, all of these cities are now winning the, you know, the battle for talent. So that's one piece. And it also led venture capitalists sitting in places like Silicon Valley because suddenly they had to do meetings with entrepreneurs by Zoom if you're getting a pitch from an entrepreneur, it doesn't really matter if they're a mile away or a thousand miles away, and that opened up more capital going to, you know, to, to, to more entrepreneurs. And that coupled with the other things that have been bubbling, uh, I think is, is, is very encouraging in terms of what likely will happen over the next, you know, you know, call it 10 years. So if you take sectors that are likely to be uh, sectors that are gonna see a lot of good venture capital money in and good venture capital companies arise, what are a couple sectors that you would think are attractive, biotech, uh, quantum computing, what would you say are there's a bunch of There's a bunch of technology-centric things, including those, synthetic biology, also one that's interesting, a lot of things around, you know, kind of sustainability is interesting, a lot more climate tech investing than you saw before. But I look at it a little bit differently. I, I focus less on the technologies and more on how a variety of technologies can come together, converge, to reimagine some of the biggest industries in the world that also happen to be the most important aspects of our lives. How do we stay healthy? What do we eat? How do we move right. around? How do we invest? Things like that, pretty basic things. And while there's been some uh, disruption of to call it healthcare in the last you know, 30, 40 years, not that much compared to other sectors. And I think you'll see a lot more in the next uh, you know, couple, couple decades. And this goes back to the rise of the rest, which is if you're gonna be successful in really reimagining healthcare, it's actually not about the technology. It's not about the software. That's sort of the table stakes. The real success will come from systems level change, systems integration, which requires partnerships. How do you get hospitals to embrace it and doctors and nurses to use it and health plans to pay for it and governments to allow it? This is a lot, that's where the real battle is. And guess what? If partners are critical, take healthcare as an example, as you know, some of the most important you know, hospitals that could be the most you know, important partners are in places like Baltimore with Johns Hopkins or in Minnesota with uh, Mayo or in Ohio with the Cleveland Clinic or in Texas with MD Anderson. Those suddenly become the anchor you know, partners. So I think that's why this is so, uh, so interesting. So I, think we're, I think you're done now. One, one final question. <laughs> but, um, I see we have the president of the Washington Commanders here. I see you went in your book, you went to the Green, Green Bay to get some companies, is that right? We did. And anything good in Green Bay? Anything a good come out of Green Bay? <laughs> David, you need to get out on the road more. Right. 
so uh, I'm not going to get into this, you know, Packers, Commanders thing, particularly with Jason sitting here at the table. But I will say that my wife, Jean, uh, for her birthday, uh, has always wanted to go to Lambeau Field for a game. So we did. And we, we had been to Green Bay before, and, and you know, it, it was one of the cities we visited on our bus tour know, four or five years ago. So we went back. And it was interesting to see what happened. That when we were there, we were talking about how to catalyze a startup community. And when we went back, a partnership had been solidified with the Green Bay Packers and with Microsoft and with a bunch of other companies. And they built right across the street from Lambeau Field an entire innovation campus and put an accelerator there and a venture fund there and a bunch of different things. It would only be possible with the credibility in Green Bay of the Packers and the real estate they owned across the street and the, and the funding of, of, uh, of Microsoft, which was interested in expanding some of these this regional uh, activities. So that is an example of a city that is on the rise. A bunch of really interesting companies have, have, uh, have formed there and, and uh, it's been great to see. It was great to go back for that game, although it was in December in Green Bay. It's, a little bit cold, so I wish my wife had a birthday in the <laughs> summer, or September at least, I guess would be better for football, but. Okay. All right, my turn? Yeah, go ahead. All right. All right. So, first of all, <laughs> some of you know this, but not everybody, that uh, David has led this economic club for 14 years, I think, 15 years maybe. Uh, yes? Yeah. So, and, it's going to lead into a question of, 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 of the book. But I want you, for some of you people know this, but not everybody, to tell the story of how you got in the business of being this media star, interviewing people with your you know, shows and then coming out with this you know, flurry <laughs> of books. What, what, what got you into the, well, you know, instead of just you know, Carlisle and minding okay. your own business, suddenly you're like, well. like <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> Um, now, what happened was uh, Carlisle uh, had a business model, uh, as you all know, when you when you're have investors, you have an annual meeting to tell them how it's going. I came up with the idea many years ago, 30 some years ago, that rather than have one fund at a time, we could, we could have one fund that's a buyout fund, and then we'd have a growth capital fund, a real estate fund, we'd have multiple funds. That was unique at the time. It doesn't deserve a Nobel Prize, but it was a unique idea that you have multiple funds, and you take advantage of your brand name and sell fund B to somebody who liked you in fund A. And it's kind of a brand extension. And so eventually what we were doing is we would have fun annual meetings in this hotel actually. Uh, we'd have the fun annual meetings and we would uh, not only be telling people how their fund was doing, but we'd be selling new funds. To do that, I would get um, former presidents of the United States, secretaries of state, people that would be a draw. So somebody wouldn't want to hear Rubenstein talk about how great the fund was, but if you know, a famous former president was there. And so to do that, I would pay them the large fees. And, um, you know, some of them were boring. They were very boring. <laughs> um, you know, I, I paid uh, very large fees to some very famous people, and they were boring. So I said to their speaking agent, would, would it matter if I just interviewed them? Maybe I could make it a little more interesting. They said, is the fee going to be the same? I said, yes. <laughs> the fee's the same. We don't care. So I... Um, I started interviewing him. I made Ben Bernanke look uh, funny, and uh, and uh, Hillary Clinton look likable, and everything was good. So it was good. It was good. So um, it was good. So people liked it. So I stored that in the back of my brain. Then Vernon Jordan called me up one day, and he said he wanted to see me in his deep voice. Uh, I wanted you to come to my office right away, or the next day I was, and come there at a certain time. So I get there, and he said, I'm going to close the door. And I want you to be the next president of the Economic Club of Washington. And I said, well, I don't really, I'm not a member of the club. And what did you really have to do? And he said, we have four meetings a year. All you have to do is get um, four speakers, let them speak, and then you get questions from the members, and you read them. I said, okay, I'll do that. So the first couple people I got were boring. <laughs> and so I got questions from the members, none of whom the members are here, of course. And the questions weren't so great. So I would make up the questions, <laughs> thinking I, I could get something more funnier than the questions I was getting from. So I did it and people laughed a little bit. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna junk the format and just go to interviews. And I started doing it. And then after a number of years, uh, some people here suggested the Bloomberg and then Bloomberg 
put it on TV. And then I remember Mike Bloomberg kicking it off. I said, Mike, you know, what are you going to call this? He said, we'll call it the David Rubenstein Show. And I said, Mike, a long Jewish ethnic name is not going to work. He says, <laughs> Mike Bloomberg said, no, it's not a problem. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so we did it, and uh, that's that's kind of what happened. So, okay, more than you wanted to it's know. A, no, it's a great it's a great story because it's sort of you know one thing led to something which led something to other like things, that. which then led to a series of books. And so. How did you, when did you decide well, to write the first, okay. your fourth book, one, two, three, four, fourth um, book. How did well, you decide to write the first book? And then we'll get to the fourth book. Okay, so, Some deep, um, penetrating, well, I, difficult I started, questions. I started a program in, at the uh, Library of Congress to interview a great historian about American history in front of members of Congress uh, only, and the theory that members of Congress should know about American history. And because it was maybe, a, well, Doris, Doris has come to those dinners, and, uh, you know, a theory was if anybody should know about American history, it'd be members of Congress. So I, would, I started it uh, many years ago, and we now try to do it once a month, subject to the schedules and so forth. And, uh, and members like it because it's the only time they can come together uh, where press isn't there, they can sit with people in the opposite party, the opposite house, and it's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, a pleasant evening, and they, they seem to like it. And so I decided ultimately to take the interviews, edit them down, put it in a book form. It did okay, and then I took some other interviews I'd done, and I put them in a leadership book, and then another one and, and, and on, uh, on American history. And then uh, this one was uh, more specifically to, uh, from people I had been interviewed over the years, various forms, or specifically for this book, who were investors. And the idea was, let's just say, uh, let's just see what the best ideas are that the best investors have come up with. And the book is really about the best investors in the various fields, what they, or their secrets are, their backgrounds. But I recognize, as I said in the beginning of the book, if you read a book uh, on, off by Tiger Woods, you're not going to be Tiger Woods. And you're not going to be Warren Buffett by reading this book. But it, it's designed for three types of people. They, a student who might be considering going into investing and wants to learn what it's like. Two, the average person who has an average amount of money, relatively speaking, who tries to say, well, maybe I'll pick stocks myself, pick bonds myself. What kind of principles should they have? Or somebody who says, I can't pick stocks and bonds myself, but I'll pick fund managers. And how do you pick fund managers? So it's for the average person to kind of learn a little bit about what I've learned from, from the, these people, but also from my own experience over many years in investing. So there's the, the chapters on specific investors and lessons learned, but then you did a nice job at the beginning of kind of summarizing based on the different interviews and your own experience what the 13 traits of good investors are. Right. Okay. Can you name the 13 traits? Okay. No, I'm kidding. I can, I can I'm, do it. I'm kidding. You cannot. You I have can. a perfect memory. I can, I can never remember more than three of anything. I, 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 okay. But 13 is way beyond. Right. But I, I, I picked a few that I'm going to ask you about it. That's okay, go ahead. A few of those 13. Go ahead. Because I now actually think if I challenge you, you would know all 13. <laughs> I'd hate that. All right, one of them is, is kind of the background of investors, that they right. tended to have more of a, get to talk about the upbringing and, and the takeaway yeah. from that, because it's kind um, of interesting. It may not surprise you to hear that the background of the great investors, the greatest investors in our country, they did not come from extremely wealthy families. Uh, if your father or mother was a billionaire, probably you're not gonna turn out to be a great investor for lots of reasons, but they tended to come from blue collar families or from lower middle income families. Some cases, like Bill Gates, he's not a great investor, but he came from families that are well established, um, not fabulously wealthy. Bill Gates' father wasn't fabulously wealthy, but middle class. So you, you, you heard something like Bill Gates is not a good investor? Can I, I would say he's not an investor. He's more of an it, entrepreneur, but I would say that, that he, he isn't a classified as an investor. So also you talk about conventional wisdom, right. bucking. You want know, to talk about that? The most important thing that great investors have is they're willing to buck conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom will be to say, now's a good time to invest here or there or somewhere else. And they say, no, that's not right. I'm going to go do something else. That's what they have done more than, than the average investor. For example, today, the most common mistake that investors make is when the markets are going down, they get out, and the markets are going up, they jump in. Generally, that's not the best thing to do. So right now, the great investors are saying, okay, prices are down. They're down by, I don't know, 25% from the peak. Now's the time to buy because things are probably inevitably going to come back. It may take a year or two, but that's not what the average investor does. But that's what the, can, the great investor looks for something where it's the opposite of what the average conventional wisdom person would, would do. Failures and setbacks. Failure is a great learning lesson. Uh, we all have had failures. And if you were an investor and you haven't failed, you really haven't been an investor. Anybody that's, that's an investor has lost money on things, done bad deals. That's inevitable. 
but the trick is to learn from it. And a lot of these investors have learned from it. And uh, you know, there always are people that exception to this, but generally because you learn from your mistakes, you tend to be somewhat humble. Now, there are some people that are arrogant in the investment world, just as there are some people who are arrogant in the political world. But generally, they have a fair amount of humility because they know they've made mistakes, they've lost money, and they, they, uh, and they, they keep that in their brain. So speaking of humility, you do start off the, the book with a couple of personal <laughs> anecdotes around uh, some of the companies that you had an, either an opportunity to invest right. in and you passed right. or you owned some stock and you sold them a little early. Let's start with the first one and you tell us a little story about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Okay. So just the, the point I tried to make at the beginning I'll talk about is, is this. All of life is about, in my view, uh, predicting what the future is going to be. Should I marry this person? What's the future going to be with this person? Should I go to this school? What's my future going to be if I go to this school? Should I get in this profession? And you're trying to predict what's going to happen five years, 10 years down the road if you make that decision. In, but there's no perfect metric, measurement. There's no metric that says, if I do this, here's the score I'm going to get. No perfect metric that everybody agrees to. But investing, there is a perfect metric. Profit, loss, internal rate of return. So investing is all about predicting the future. Is the company going to be good? Is it got a good management? The economic in, in, in situation going to be good? So I um, you know, made a lot of mistakes. The one you're referring to is when my now son-in-law was at, at Harvard, um, he said, would you like to meet my, uh, my uh, classmate from Philip Sexer in Harvard? He's starting a company. And I said, what does it do? He said, it's like a dating service for, for Harvard, but it's going to be all Ivy League schools soon. I said, geez, I've seen this in the 1960s or 70s, these dating service companies. They never work. So if I had put $30,000 in, it would be worth about $15 billion a little while ago. But if somebody else, somebody else did it, but one of, his, one of his classmates put the $30,000 in. So I, I made a mistake. We all do. And the other one, which is another, <laughs> this is only, I'm going to end with us, then we're going to get to the other topic. But it's a great story. And I, I actually appreciate you, kind of, the humility of uh, how you do make mistakes in investing. Is your, you know, there's a little company called Amazon you had right. something to do with? Yes. Um, Carlisle bought a company called Baker and Taylor, which was started around the 1850s, the second biggest book distributor in the United States. Had not made a profit since 1850. Never profitable. <laughs> it was always break even. And we bought it from W.R. Grace. And then, you know, one day a salesman at a meeting said, guess what? Some idiot came along and he wanted to rent our bibliography because he's going to sell books over the Internet. And we said, how is he going to do that? And he said, well, I don't know. But he said he wanted to rent our bibliography. He wanted to give us 25% of the company in return for letting us use the bibliography. And our salesman said, I'm too smart for that. I got $100,000 a year for five years. <laughs> So I didn't even know the name of the company. Then about a year later, I read about a company called Amazon that was going to sell books over the internet. So I called the salesman up and I said, hey, there might be another idiot that will rent this thing. He says, no, that's the idiot that we already got. Um, so I said, oh. So I went out to see Jeff Bezos. I flew out. He was in a ramshackle office building. It was a tiny, tiny office building, or office. And, and in those days, all his desk, all they had was these horses, these wooden horses with a with a door on top of the, as the, as the tabletop. And basically, if, in those days, if you wanted a book, you basically sent him an email. He would then send the email to the publisher. The publisher sent it back to him. And two weeks later, you would get the book. And he would take the books to the, to the uh, post office every night himself. And uh, I said, Jeff, look, I've been around a while. This is not going to work. And uh, <laughs> you know, you're never going to beat Barnes & Noble. He says, oh, Barnes & Noble, they don't really notice. I said, come on, Barnes & Noble, they're bigger. You're nothing. And anyway, I said, I, anyway, I think you'll do better than I once thought. So I'll tell you what, I'll take the 25% of your company now. He said, David, that was two years ago. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, you know we, we've advanced a little bit, but I'll give you 1% of the company in return for tearing up the $100,000 a year. So we did, but we had so little confidence as soon as the company went public, we sold it. Yes, that was my reaction too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you... Kind of, kind of like my stealing the third wave and rise. <laughs> Got that off your chest. You'll sleep better tonight. So on a more successful path, you uh, were co-founder of Carlisle. Uh, and at the time, it's a little bit you know, similar to my, what I talked about with Rise of Rest. You started it in Washington, D.C., which didn't seem to most people an obvious place to start it because, of course, every real investment firm was in New York. Why don't you tell the story of... of oh. uh, the reason why, we did why it you, wh how you started and came together with the other two partners and, and why you started in D.C. and why you stayed in D.C.? Well, the answer is that I 
as everybody probably knows, I worked for President Carter. We lost the election in 1980. I had to go back and practice law. I wasn't a very good lawyer, as everybody who was my client would probably tell you. So uh, I read about Bill Simon starting a, a doing a buyout, leveraged buyout company of card, uh, Gibson greeting cards. He made, uh, put in a million and a half dollars and made $80 million in about 18 months. And I didn't know what a leveraged buyout was, but I thought it was better than practicing law. So I went to Bill Miller, who was then Secretary of the Treasury, who was, had been Secretary of the Treasury under Carter, and said, why don't we start a leveraged buyout firm just like uh, uh, Bill Simon did? And he said, no, he didn't want to do that. Maybe knowing my legal skills wouldn't be so great. He, I said I'd, I'd provide the legal skills. He didn't probably want those. So he didn't start it. So I decided I would do it on my own. And ultimately, with a couple of people I recruited, we started with four people. And we did it in Washington. This is the reason. Senator Everett Dirksen, the former minority leader of the, in the Senate, said famously, if you're getting kicked out of town, get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade. <laughs> and what does that mean? That means take advantage of the situation you find yourself in. So I'm in Washington, D.C. I don't have any credibility. I'm not an investment banker. Most of the buyout boys of those days were investment bankers, former investment bankers. So I said, we'll do it in Washington, and we'll say that we understand companies heavily affected by the federal government better than those guys in New York. It sounded credible, and um, so we, that's what we did. Worked out pretty well. Yeah, okay. But uh, I could always do better, and we made some mistakes for sure, but uh, it's worked out. So you mentioned, but kind of blew right over, the worked at the Carter White House. <laughs> you know where we're going here, don't you? It seems right now we have an inflation problem in this country. And I think you have some experience right, I did. on inflation. Could you share with these people your personal experience and yeah. how successful you were at the Carter White House on the matter of inflation? inflation. Well, uh, we, we set a record. Um, I think we got it. <laughs> you know, it's like 15, 16 percent. Who's counting? Um, it was a different type of economy then and so forth, different situation. But it was a, very high. It's very hard to, hard to run for re-election when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you have high inflation. And, and we, we were coming up with uh, a recession, too, probably. And as some of you may have heard me say, what, what happened is Carter had an inflation advisor, Fred Kahn, and he said, well, the only way to beat this inflation is to get interest rates higher. And if we have higher interest rates, we might have a recession. And Carter hauled him into the Oval Office and said, look, Fred, I know you're an honest guy, but I'm running for re-election. Don't use the R word. It scares people. And Fred Kahn said, what am I supposed to say? He said, just be honest, but don't say the R word. So, Carter, so Fred Kahn went out in the briefing room in the White House and said, I think we're heading into higher interest rates. We're likely to go into a banana. And he used the word banana as a substitute for, for, for recession because he realized reporters weren't going to put a headline that says Carter's inflation advisor thinks we're heading into a banana. And it sort of worked. Um, but the truth is, uh, you know, when, when inflation was very high, uh, Carter was told the only way to solve it really was to get Paul Volcker in, who had been the head of the New York Fed, and let him increase interest rates. And, you know, some people forget, but in those days, the Fed did not tell you what it was going to do before. It didn't tell you what it did afterwards. It was just very opaque. And so one weekend, without telling anybody, he, Paul Volcker and the Fed increased interest rates uh, 200 basis points. We think we have higher, you know, when we go up 75 basis points. On one weekend, he just did 200 basis points, no telegraphing of it, and ultimately that produced, uh, unfortunately, a recession. All right. Well, on the same happy topic, okay. uh, the Carlisle has had some amazing executives over the years, including one of your former colleagues, Jay Powell, is now at the Fed. Why don't you tell us a little bit of a story of what he was doing at Carlisle? Well, I and but I, I didn't ask you about one of your former colleagues who's now the chief of staff of the White House. Uh, we can get to that in the next <laughs> session, but this is my, this is, uh, my clock, my okay, friend. Yes, I, I, I've I, got the microphone on the I, I, I hired a young man who had been leaving the, the Bush administration, George Herbert Walker Bush administration. He had been under secretary of uh, uh, for international finance, I believe, and he'd been a lawyer and investment banker, and um, he didn't want to go back to New York. He was from Washington area, and so we hired him, and he did consumer and industrial things for us in the buyout area for a number of years, and then one day he said he was going to do more uh, public service kind of things, and left, and next thing you know, he's a member of the Fed, and the next thing you know, he's chairman of the Fed. So, uh, you know, what can I say? I mean, we had another guy left not too long ago, and I said, Glenn, you're never going to be elected governor of Virginia. I was going to get to that, but I'm glad you <laughs> I said, Glenn, up. I know politics pretty well. I've been around a lot longer than you. And Glenn, you, you're, a, you're a private equity guy. How are you going to get elected? He says, well, I have some ideas. Anyway, And now, now, now there's rumblings he might run for president. That's what I read. Uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, look, 
Um, it's hard to believe, you know, sometimes you, you think of somebody as somebody who's worked for you, and then all of a sudden they, it's like having a child. You see the child, they grow up, and one day they say, well, Dad, thanks very much for your advice. I don't really need your advice anymore. You ever had that? Oh, I, I, I think I understand what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, you know, Glenn is obviously, um, you know, I shouldn't say obviously, he seems to be looking like he's running around the country, and maybe he'll run for something, some other office. So if, if it's President Youngkin, we'll, we'll, you'll be part of the cabinet, like Treasury. <laughs> I mean, all Carlisle takes I, over I, the White House here. You got I, I think Powell my, my, I think my got... inflation record will uh, keep that from happening. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get back to the book. You also, it, it, it was interesting to figure out how to, rather than just have a bunch of, you know, kind of disparate interviews, you've decided right. to package them in three different sections in terms of, you know, different kinds of in, investing. Why don't you talk about those three areas? Right. So when you, you know, the publisher always comes to you and says, well, it's nice to have all these interviews, but like, you know, we got to categorize them and so forth. So I had three categories, mainstream, which is stocks and bonds and, and real estate, core real estate, which is what traditionally most investors put in their portfolio. And historically, up until, let's say, 30 years ago or so, that's what people who invested did, stocks, bonds, and probably real estate. Now we have another category that's in the book, alternatives, which is something that's alternative to stocks and bonds designed to get a higher rate of return with obviously somewhat higher risk, and that would be things like buyouts for private equity, venture capital, distressed debt, opportunistic real estate, hedge funds, things like that. And, um, and then there's a third category I've called cutting edge, which are things that are further on the spectrum of risk, but maybe we'll get a higher rate of return. And one, a category, one thing in that category is cryptocurrencies. And so how do you think people here should think about those three? Well, I think stocks and bonds and traditional things are you know, generally going to get you a reasonable rate of return. Over the last 100 years or so, fixed income instruments in the United States will probably get you 2 to 4%. Uh, public equities will probably get you 6 to 7 to 8%. Alternatives try to get you double-digit rates of return. Uh, probably now buyouts will be maybe 15, 16, 17% net eight rate of return, maybe venture capital in the good years might get you 20% or something like that net. So it's different. It depends on your risk profile and, and how much money you have and what you're doing. And the main point I tried to con convey to people is that uh, try to in treat your money like you do your, anything else that you care a lot about. In other words, if you make a lot of money in something or another, in making widgets, don't all of a sudden just you know, think you're a genius because you made a lot of money in making widgets and you start investing without knowing what you're doing. Read, pay attention to people that can help you, but for the average person, the average person who's not a professional investor, what they should really do, in my view, generally get a good manager who can manage them, and I give us it's kind of 10 or so principles of what you should look for in picking a money manager, and, and uh, you know, because I think that picking a mo good money manager can help you is probably a good thing for most people. So you've done the book tour now for three weeks, four weeks, something like that. Um, what's been the biggest surprise, something that you didn't see coming, either questions people are asking or, or the way people have, have uh, reviewed it, or what, any big surprises? Um, I would say, you know, I, for those people who haven't written books, how many people have written books here? Anybody written a book? Okay. So the book writing business, and Steve knows this as well, as we were talking about before, um, most people who write a book want people to read it. I mean, that's the theory. <laughs> and, uh, and for most people, to read the book, you have to buy the book. So not people here, of course, but for most people. And so, um, you know, what you have to do is get people to know about it. So how do you do that? Well, you do a series of, uh, you participate on every podcast out there. Uh, there are lots of podcasts, and some podcasts are known for selling books, so you and I are spending a lot of time on podcasts. Secondly, you do radio interviews. I've done some where you spend a half a day, you know, on a radio, every five minutes, one show in different locations, and maybe they sell books, maybe they don't. Then you uh, also go on TV shows. You and I have both been on Morning Joe and, and Squawk Box, and you know, maybe it sells books you don't really know. And then, uh, you know, obviously, you, you also go to book fairs, book festivals, uh, library events, and do the best you can. And you know, the theory is that maybe more people get to pay, pay attention to the book, they'll maybe like it and maybe read it and recommend it to other people. And sometimes it works. Now, if you're Bob Woodward, you don't need to do that. Bob Woodward can send his book out and it's going to have you going to first printing of 500,000 and the next day it's a second printing of a million copies. If you're um, James Patterson, you don't need to do that. John Grisham, you don't need to do that. But, you know, at least in my case, I still have to do all that. So I'm still doing it and it, it did make some bestseller lists and 
you know, it makes you feel good. And, uh, but in the end, what you want to do is you spend a year on a, on a book, you want people to read it. I mean, you feel like you've got something worth saying. So, um, you know, but it, the way I've done these books, these, this is a, a unique style maybe in the sense that what I do is I take the interviews I've done, I try to put them into, you know, edit them down so they, they read a little bit better because sometimes people talk in interviews, it's longer, and you have to edit it down, then summarize what they've said, and then do some opening principles and so forth, and design to, you know, let people to read it, then you can pick any part of the book you want, and so you don't have to read it from the, from the beginning to the end. And, you know, it seems to have met some of the market. It's not going to sell a million copies, but they are books sometimes that are perennials, which, which means they, they will sell for, for many, many years. They keep reprinting them and so forth. So that's what... So you've done four so far. How many do you have a plan? Of like I'm trying to do about one a year or so because I, I didn't do... I don't How long are you going to live? Well, um... <laughs> Trying to get a sense it's, of we're talking. Uh, 20, 30, I don't know. What uh, I don't know. Some days I, you know, I always, if I exercise more, it'd be better. I always think about exercising. I have the exercise by osmosis theory, which is walk by the equipment and maybe it'll work. But um, I, I would say, uh, you know, I don't understand why when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, I didn't write any books. And then later in life, I'm writing these books. So I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, you've written. Maybe now you have something to say. I have something to say. Maybe. Brand. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But, um, you know, I, so I, I, enjoy, I enjoy it, and it's fun, and, keep, you know, it's obviously easier to write a book when, you, when COVID is around because you don't have to go physically meet people. You, can, you have a great excuse. Let's do it by Zoom, and people say, okay, because they don't want to meet you either, right? So, uh, so it's easier now when you have to go meet people. Are you shocked that there are actually people here at the dinner? <laughs> well, I knew you were a draw. That's why we wanted to have you. <laughs> so um, you have had a really extraordinary career um, and uh, in a variety of different sectors, but in some ways this, you know, most recent chapter, not just on, uh, you know, the books and the media side, but what you've done on the philanthropic side, kind of patri patriotic philanthropy, including many organizations, Smithsonian and others that, that, that uh, uh, you've been part of. What triggered that? And, you know, how much, how do you decide which oh. things you want to really commit to? Well, there were three people in Washington who signed the giving pledge at the beginning. You and your wife, Roger and his wife, and my wife and me. And uh, so there were only three of us. We're all here tonight. And there were 40 of us in the beginning. And um, I would say, uh, you know, if you come from modest circumstances and you get lucky in life and you make a fair amount of money, uh, what are you going to do with it? You can build a pyramid to yourself. The pharaohs did that. but probably not that useful. Um, you can give it all to your children, um, and sometimes your children might think that's a good idea. Um, there's no evidence that giving, you know, staggering sums to children makes them better human beings, but maybe they would disagree with that. And then you can give it away, and then the question is, do you give it away while you're alive or wait till you, you die? And, you know, I, uh, you and I and uh, uh, Roger have decided to give it away while we're, uh, large parts of it away while we're alive. And, you know, you can get to see the, the benefits of it. In my own case, my philanthropic principles are, um, one, try to start something otherwise wouldn't get started, two, finish something otherwise wouldn't get finished, have an intellectual interest in it so that I want to be involved in it, not just write a check, and four, see some real progress in my lifetime. But, you know, and then I picked various things some people know about, but, you know, you've been very generous mm -hmm. as well, and you and your wife have done many things, as Roger uh, has done a great many things as well. So... You know, philanthropy, I'd like to remind people, is derived from an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. And you can love humanity with your time, which is the most valuable commodity. You can't make more time. You can make more money. You can't make more time. So, you know, I would say people should volunteer and, and give their time. And I always try to speak to audiences when I, when I make speeches. Say, try to find something that you can do a little bit more to give back to the country. And, you know, just not to be the biggest thing in the world. It can just something, and that's something that you will be proud of and your children will be proud of what you're having done. And that's what I think a lot of people um, are doing. All right. I think we'll end on that note and just urge you all hey. to read the book, <laughs> How to Invest, or read by Rise David Rubenstein. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>